Hello and welcome to episode 14 of the Chronicles of Narnia, the Silent God of Water 20 story time. And we're now up to The Magician's Nephew, chapter 14, The Planting of the Tree. Well done, said Aslan in a voice that made the earth shake. Then Diggory knew that all the Narnians had heard those words and that the story of them would be handed down from father to son in that new world for hundreds of years and perhaps forever. But he was not, but he was in no danger of feeling conceited for he didn't think about it at all now that he was face to face with Aslan. This time he found he could walk straight into the lion, he could look straight into the lion's eyes. He had forgotten his troubles and felt absolutely content. Well done, son of Adam, said the lion again. For this fruit you have hungered and thirsted and wept. No hand but yours shall sow the seed of the tree that is to be the protection of Narnia. Throw the apple towards the river bank where the ground is soft. Diggory did as he was told. Everyone had grown so quiet that you could hear the soft thump where it fell into the mud. It is well thrown, said Aslan. Let us now proceed to the coronation of King Frank of Narnia and Helen his queen. The children now notice these two for the first time. They were dressed in strange and beautiful clothes from their shoulders rich robes and from their shoulders rich robes flowered out behind them to where the to where four dwarfs held up the king's train, and four river nymphs, the queens. Their heads were bare, but Helen had let her hair down, and it made a great improvement in her appearance. But it was neither hair nor clothes that made them look so different from their old selves. Their faces had a new expression, especially the king's. All the sharpness and cunning and quarrelsomeness which he had picked up as a London cabby seemed to have been washed away, and the courage and kindness which he had always had were easier to see. Perhaps it was the air of the young world that had done it or talking with Aslan, or both. Upon my word, whispered Fledge to Polly, <coughs> bless me. My old master's been changed nearly as much as I have. Why, he's a real master now. Yes, but don't buzz in my ear like that, said Polly. It tickles so. Now, said Aslan, some of you, Undo that tangle you have made with those trees, and let us see what we shall find there. Diggory now saw that where four trees grew close together, their branches had all been laced together or tied together with switches so as to make a sort of cage. The two elephants with their trunks and a few dwarfs with their little axes soon got uh, yeah, soon got it all undone. There were three things inside. One was a young tree that seemed to be made of gold. The second was a young tree that seemed to be made of silver. But the third was a miserable object in muddy clothes, sitting hunched up between them. Gosh, whispered Diggory, Uncle Andrew? To explain all this, we must go back a bit. 
the beasts, you remember, had, tied, had tried planting and watering him. When the watering brought him to his senses, he found himself soaking wet, buried up to his thighs in earth, which was quickly turning into mud and surrounded by more wild animals than he had ever dreamed of in his life before. It is perhaps not surprising that he began to scream and howl. This was in a way a good thing, for it at last persuaded everyone, even the warthog, that he was alive. So they dug him up again. His trousers were in a really shocking state by now. As soon as his legs were free, he tried to bolt, but one swift curl of the elephant's trunk round his waist soon put an end to that. Everyone now thought he must be safely kept somewhere till Aslan had time to come and see him and say what should be done about him. So they made a sort of cage or coop all around him. They then offered him everything they could think of to eat. The donkey collected great piles of thistles and threw them in, but Uncle Andrew didn't seem to care about them. The squirrels bombarded him with volleys of nuts, but he only covered his head with his hands and tried to keep out of the way. Several birds flew in, uh, flew to and fro diligently dropping worms on him. The bear was especially kind. During the afternoon he found a wild bee's nest and instead of eating it himself, which he would very much like to do, uh, like to have done, this worthy creature brought it back to Uncle Andrew. But this was in fact the worst failure of all. The bear lobbed the whole sticky mass over the top of the enclosure and unfortunately it hit Uncle Andrew. Slap in the face. Not all the bees were dead. The bear, who would not at all have minded being hit in the face by a honeycomb himself, could not understand why Uncle Andrew staggered back, slipped and sat down. And it was sheer bad luck that he sat down on a pile of on the pile of thistles, and anyway, as the warthog said, quite a lot of honey has got into that creature's mouth, and that's bound to have done it some good. They were really getting quite fond of their strange pet, and hoped that Aslan would allow them to keep it. The cleverer ones were quite sure by now that at least some of the noises which came out of his mouth had a meaning. They christened him Brandy because they made that noise so because he made that noise so often. In the end, however, they had to leave him there for the night. Aslan was busy all that day instructing the new king and queen and doing other important things, and could not attend to poor old Brandy. What with the nuts, pears, apples and bananas that had been thrown into him, he did fairly well for supper, but it didn't, but it wouldn't be true to say that he passed an agreeable night. Bring out that creature, said Aslan. One of the elephants lifted Uncle Andrew in his trunk and laid him at the lion's feet. He was too frightened to move. Please, Aslan, said Polly, could you say something to, to unfrighten him? And then could you say something to prevent him from ever coming back here again? Do you think he wants to? Uh, said Aslan. Well, Aslan, said Polly. 
he might send someone else. He's so excited about the bar off lamp the, the bar off lamppost growing into a lamppost tree and and he thinks he thinks great folly, child, said Aslan. This world is bursting with life for those few days because the song with which I called it into, into life still hangs in the air and rumbles in the ground. It will not be so far, it will not be so for long. But I cannot tell that to this old sinner, and I cannot comfort him either. He has made himself unable to hear my voice. If I spoke to him, he would only hear growlings and roarings. Oh, Adam's sons, how cleverly you defend yourselves against all that might be that all that might do you good. And I will give him the only gift he is still able to receive. He bowed his grey head rather sadly and breathed into the magician's terrified face. Sleep, he said. Sleep and be separated for some few hours from all the torments you have devised for yourself. Uncle Andrew immediately rolled over with closed eyes and began breathing peacefully. Carry him aside and lay him down, said Aslan. Now, now, dwarfs, show your smithcraft. Let me see you make two crowns for your king and queen. More dwarfs than you could dream of rushed forward to the golden tree. They had all its leaves stripped off and some of its branches torn off too. Before you could say Jack Robinson. And now the children could see it did not merely look golden, but it was of real soft gold. It had of course sprung up from the half sovereigns which had fallen out of Uncle Andrew's pocket when he was turned upside down, just as the silver had grown up from the half crowns. From nowhere, as it seemed, piles of dry brushwood for fuel, a little anvil, hammers, tongs, and bellows were produced. Next moment, how those dwarfs loved their work. The fire was blazing, the bellows were roaring, the gold was melting, and the hammers were clinking. Two moles from Aslan. No, two moles whom Aslan had set, had set to dig which was what they liked best earlier in the day pulled out a pile of precious stones at the dwarf's feet, under the clever fingers of the little smiths, two crowns took shape, not ugly heavy things like modern European crowns, but light, delicate, beautifully shaped circles that you could really wear and look nicer by wearing. The kings were set with rubies and the queens with emeralds. When the crowns had been cooled, in the river, Aslan made Frank and Helen kneel before him and placed the crowns on their heads. Then he said, Rise up, King and Queen of Narnia, father and mother of many things that shall be in Narnia and the Isles of Arkenland. Be just and merciful and brave. The blessing is upon you. Then everyone cheered and 
that cheered or bayed and or neighed or trumpeted or clapped its wings at the royal pair. And the royal pair stood looking solemn and a little shy. But all the nobler of their shyness, and while Diggory was still cheering, he heard the deep voice of Aslan beside him saying, Look! Everyone sat in that, everyone in that crowd turned his head, and then everyone drew a long breath of wonder and delight. A little way off, towering over their heads, they saw a tree which had certainly not been there before. It must have grown up silently, yet swiftly as a flag rises when you pull it up on a flagstaff. While they were all bruised about the coronation, while they were all busied about the coronation, its spreading branches seemed to cast a light rather than a shade and silver apples peeped out like stars from under every leaf. But it was the smell which came from it even more than the sight that had made everyone draw in their breath. For a moment, one could hardly think about anything else. Son of Adam, said Aslan, you have sown well, and you Narnians, let it be your first care to guard this tree, for it is your shield, the witch of whom I told you has fled far away into the north of the world. She will live on there, growing stronger in dark magic. But while that tree flourishes, she will never come down into Narnia. She dare not come within a hundred miles of the tree, for its smell, which is joy and life and health to you, is death and horror and despair to her. Everyone was staring solemnly at the tree when Aslan suddenly swung around his head scattering golden gleams of light from his mane as he did so and fixed his large eyes on the children. What is it, children? he said, for he caught them in the very act of whispering and nudging to one another. Oh, Aslan, sir, said Diggory, turning red, I forgot to tell you, the witch has already eaten one of those apples, one of the same kind that tree grew from. He hadn't really said all he was thinking, but Polly at once said, uh, uh, but Polly at once said it for him. Diggory was always much more afraid than she of looking a fool. So we thought, Aslan, she said, that there must be some mistake, and she can't really mind the smell of those apples. Why do you think that, daughter of Eve? said the lion. Well, she ate one, child, he replied. That is why all the rest are now a horror, uh, uh, all, the ho all the rest are now a horror to her. That is what happens to those who pick and eat fruits at the wrong time and in the wrong way. The fruit is good, but they loathe it ever after. Oh, I see, said Polly, and I suppose because she took it in the wrong way, it won't work for her. I mean, it won't make her always young and all that. Alas, said Aslan, shaking his head, it will. Things always work according to their nature. She has won her heart's desire. She was unwearying. She has unwearying strength and endless days like a goddess. But length of days with an evil heart is only length of misery, and already she begins to know it. All get that way. 
But all get all get what they want and do not always like it. I I nearly ate one myself, Aslan, said Diggory. Would I? You would, child, said Aslan. For the fruit always works. It must work, but it does not work happily for any who pluck it for their own will. If any Narnian unbidden had stolen an apple and planted it here to protect Narnia, it would have protected Narnia, but it would have done so by making Narnia into another strong and cruel empire like Chan. Not the kindly land I mean it to be. And the witch tempted you to do another thing, my son. Did she not? Yes, Aslan. She wanted me to make to take an apple home to mother. Understand then that it would have healed her, but not to your joy or hers. The day would have come when both of you, when both you and she, would have locked, would have looked back and said. It would have been better to die in that illness. And Diggory could say nothing for tears. Yet for tears choked his eyes, that choked him and gave up all hopes of saving his mother's life. But at the same time, he knew that the lion knew what would have happened. and that there might be things more terrible even than losing someone you love by death. But now Aslan was speaking again, almost in a whisper. This is what would have happened, child, with a stolen apple. It is not what will happen now. What I give you now will bring joy. It will not, in your world, give endless life, but it will heal. Go, pluck her an apple from the tree. For a second, Diggory could hardly understand. It was as if the whole world had turned inside out and upside down. And then, like someone in a dream, he was walking across to the tree, and the king and queen were cheering him, and all the creatures were cheering too. He plucked the apple and put it in his pocket. Then he came back to Aslan. Please, he said, may we go home now? He had forgotten to say thank you, but he meant it, and Aslan understood. And that, my friends, was chapter 14 of The Magician's Nephew. Join me next time for the finale of The Magician's Nephew, that is, chapter 15, the end of this story and the beginning of all the others. Be there or be square.